Well, welcome everyone. My name is Tom McDowell. I'm with Green Tech Exchange. Welcome to this, the second Green Tech Exchange event on Vancouver Island. Our inaugural event, as some of you may know, was held at Royal Road University, which is near Victoria. And for those who are watching this online, just a quick overview of things. Uh, we're here in the Campbell River on the central eastern shores of Vancouver Island. And Vancouver Island, the, the largest island east of New Zealand, lies about 40 kilometers west of Vancouver in the province of British Columbia, the westernmost province in Canada. Tonight's event finds us, as I said, in Campbell River. And uh, we're very pleased to be here at North Island College. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge two folks here in the area. Don Gillingham, the Dean of Trades and Technology, and Vic Goodman of the River Corps uh, Corporation and uh, the, uh, the Economic Development Corporation here in the Camel River. So uh, just a few minutes, I'd like to share some time now to allow them to speak to, to you, the audience. So uh, Vic and Don, please come up to the podium. just like to welcome you all to North Island College. It's certainly our pleasure to be hosting this event for Green Tech Exchange Vancouver Island. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Shannon and Jason, who will be filming this event and uploading it to making it available later on. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just wanted to take a couple of minutes to uh, thank you all again for attending uh, our event tonight. Uh, I think it's going to be an exciting event. I think we've got some uh, very good speakers lined up. wanted to thank Tom for uh, giving us the opportunity to have it up here. When I first heard about it, he was talking about having it in Nanaimo, and I said, uh, wait a minute, and uh, wanted to have it here in Campbell River. Uh, I'm fairly new to Campbell River. I've been here about eight months. Uh, the month before I started my job last summer, uh, I was invited to a meeting of the Ocean Renewable Energy Group, and, and Chris Campbell's going to speak a little bit later on about the tidal energy side of things. Um, and it started me thinking about what Campbell River is interesting about uh, from, from the green energy perspective. Uh, that meeting made it fairly clear to me that the tidal energy uh, industry is still facing the commercialization gap, that ability to get its products from the product development stage through to the commercial stage, because there isn't a, a good place for them to test these products before being able to actually prove their commercial viability. And uh, I think Campbell River is very well situated to help people out in that regard. And so that's one of the things that we're starting to work on right now, is to try to identify if there's a way for us to work with industry and uh, ORAG and others to position this community uh, to somehow uh, put in place some sort of an organization whereby the technology developers could work with it to uh, essentially what I'm, what I'm hoping to be able to do is to, to put together something that's pre-permitted so that uh, organizations don't have to go through all of their own environmental uh, uh, assessments, that it's something that they can piggyback onto a, to an area that's already had that work done uh, and hopefully streamline some of the commercialization components of this industry so that we can start to build a commercial industry in Canada. So that's uh, that's my vision for Campbell River and for the tidal industry and the uh, tidal energy industry here. Uh, so that's that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thanks again, Tom, for, for allowing us to, to have this meeting here. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, let's get on with the show. I have a few more words of a general instruction for us, though. Uh, as well as acknowledging Don and, and, uh, and Vic, I'd also uh, like to point out a few things about, around, about Green Tech Exchange. It's been in existence for about three years, uh, based out of Vancouver, out of Simon Fraser University. It, they've been holding networking events there for, as I said, three years. A full range of Green Tech uh, topics, subjects, uh, and uh, we hope to build up to that here on the island in due course. We've got a full... Uh, a full uh, series of, of uh, presentations on the island this year, and uh, some, some more information will follow uh, tonight's uh, presentation. So uh, Green Tech Exchange uh, membership is, is, a, is around 1,600. That's a corporate and individuals. And we've got uh, outreach to Seattle, 
Uh, regionally, we are working on a regional cluster, and we are now uh, number four in Canada as, as clusters go, and number th and we're in the 37 uh, that are established around the world now. So it is getting regional, national, and international uh, respect and, and, and acknowledgement. So um, that said, uh, just some quick house housekeeping points. Uh, this evening's event is being recorded for later streaming, and uh, just a brief overview of the schedule. We have four panelists, and after I introduce them, they will each come up here in, in sequence, and the, uh, there will be a Q&A opportunity after that, which I will ask you to stand and answer your first name and or affiliation if you like, and then your question. I, because of the, the sound here, I'll act, I will then have to repeat the question and uh, so it's recorded, and uh, we'll go from there. So tonight's event, as, as said earlier, is, is focusing on ocean energy. And British Columbia is well positioned to take a full advantage of this as it's a mar maritime province. And, and it has a unique, um, has, as it has a unique renewable energy resource, uh, wave and tidal, the, uh, the, the, um, the technology is, 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 is prime for, for market access uh, and international outreach. It's only 10 minutes, so you're okay. <clears throat> I can talk for 30 minutes without taking a breath, so that'll tell you. Uh, I'm the CEO for Rootmeet uh, Power Corporation. Rootmeet uh, Power Corporation is uh, an entity that's owned 72.5% uh, by the Hibachisat uh, First Nation, one of the two First Nations in Port Alberta. 12.5% is owned by Cynix Energy. 10% by the Hewlett First Nation and 5% by the uh, city of uh, Port Alberni. So we have a, a fairly uh, a stable uh, private partnership, uh, public if you will, uh, that's worked so uh, very well so far. Uh, we have seven members of our board. Uh, each of the uh, partners are obviously represented on the board. So uh, the China Creek project is located about six kilometers uh, up the China Main. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, some of the logging roads in our province, uh, the, the Banfield Main uh, runs about two kilometers and then you turn off of the China Main. Six kilometers up is the intake chamber. Uh, the intake chamber obviously is to gather the water that runs through the Pensog, uh, runs uh, about five kilometers down into the powerhouse and generates uh, six and a half megs at maximum capacity. Uh, we're, we're licensed for 5.9 cubic meters per second, and for those engineers in the audience will understand what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a lot of, obviously, uh, uh, complicated elements to these projects. Uh, China Creek, when it was uh, built in 2005, was a $14 million project. So at that time, in, in the IPP industry, if it was small, uh, and I'm talking uh, the uh, standing offer program, currently, uh, uh, the maximum uh, independent power projects for the, the current standing offer program is 15 megawatts or less. So 15 megawatts or less, there's really no negotiations or minimal negotiations on the energy purchase agreement that's related to these projects. Back in 2006, uh, it was 10 megawatts or less. So any of those projects that fall under 15 megawatts now, you're part of this, what's called the standing offer program. Uh, there's been some changes, obviously, recently with the uh, Province of Clean Energy Act, which has some implications related to uh, uh, the standing offer program, because within the standing offer program is the, what's called the feed-in tariff program, and those are for five, pro uh, five megawatts or less, but new technology. Uh, and in fact, uh, we are considering that element as, as part of a project related to the Stamp River Dam facility, which is at the Great Central Lake area. And this is one of the future projects that I'm working on right now. Uh, but on an annual basis, uh, China Creek uh, in 2011 produced 30 point gigs, 30.6 gigs of power. Uh, and that was our record. Uh, previous to that was 28 gigs. And we're paid through the standing offer program based on the amount of power we produce on an annual basis. It's calculated on a monthly basis. We invoice BC Hydro at the end of the month. They pay us, hopefully, at the second week of the following month. Uh, they've been pretty good about that, so we're, we're, we're happy with that so far. Uh, as I said, it was a $14 million cost right now. Uh, I've got three other projects that I'm working on right now. One's a small uh, micro-hydro uh, project at Great Central Lake, and that's about four megs. 
another run of river at Sable River, and that's certainly the partnership uh, that we're associated with the Comox First Nation as well as Island Timberlands, who's the landowner in that case. In addition to that, we're uh, involved with uh, Flitza Creek, which is another four megawatt run of river project, and a partnership uh, with uh, Executive House Power on that one. Uh, so they're at various stages of, uh, of development, uh, but the more progressive one, obviously, and the one I've been working on most extensively is the Sable River project, and it's another six and a half uh, megawatt project. However, the Penstock, in, in comparison to uh, China Creek, for example, China Creek, we have about five, six kilometers of Penstock. Uh, Sable River is 1,400 meters. Uh, so what obviously drives these projects is the hydrology, it's the water, it's a volume of water that's falling a certain distance, and there's obviously minimum distances that it needs to follow to, uh, to generate the energy to turn the turbines. And each uh, project uh, is, is a little bit different in terms of uh, cost. Uh, ballparking projects today, today's uh, market is around four to five million per megawatt. So if you've got a six and a half megawatt project, the math is fairly straightforward. That gives you an idea. Uh, but certainly the most critical element of all of these projects in terms of running river is the hydrology. And that's uh, the power from the water and from that uh, there's uh, obviously calculations and formulas uh, uh, that uh, the engineers and others run to come up with uh, sort of a projected uh, power production. Uh, China Creek, for example, is projected to hit 24 gigs on an annual basis. And, and fortunately or unfortunately, we really didn't hit those numbers until more recent years. Uh, we did certainly have a dry spell. Uh, and we were only in production for about nine months of the year, and that's the other sort of side of uh, the run of river projects is, uh, uh, for the most part, they're seasonal, uh, but when we are in operation and you're at maximum power, you're certainly generating a significant amount of money. Uh, China Creek, 30.6 gigs of power, in, in our case, uh, translates to about $1.9 million of income uh, for last year, and we have to obviously service the debt. Uh, but it is a project that is now in sync uh, in terms of our uh, EPA. We had a 20-year EPA, and now we have 13 years left on that EPA. And once you've done the, the, the term of the EPA, then you're back in for negotiations for a new energy purchase agreement. Uh, the new standing offer program uh, really is two options. You have a 20-year EPA or a 40-year EPA, so there's minimal negotiations. Uh, in that uh, in that concept, and it really depends on the size of your project, the location of it, and, and other elements related to your projects. But they do have to make uh, financial sense at the at the end of the day, and that's really the hydrology which uh, which dictates and determines what you can generate in terms of income from these projects. Uh, <coughs> Sable River, for example, we're looking at the same numbers in terms of power generation: 24 gigawatts of power projected. But the standing offers program has changed. In 2006, in the 2006 call, the base rate for our region, and you should know that throughout the province, there's different base rates within the standing offer program. Uh, the, the base rate for the China Creek when it started was $58,000 uh, per gigawatt hour of power you produce. The current standing offer program is 102000 per gigawatt hour of power produced. So substantial difference. Uh, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, it really needs to make sense as far as uh, you know, that side of it goes because these projects do take time. There's a number of hoops to jump through. Uh, typically, between 30 and 40 approving agencies are involved uh, with these projects. Uh, and, and it's just at times very frustrating. So a lot of patience is required in terms of getting these projects off the ground. And there is obviously... Uh, a uh, certain amount of risk that goes uh, that's associated with these projects, typically between a half a million and a million dollars is what a proponent would put up and is considered risk money. Uh, in some cases, uh, you don't necessarily have to spend that amount of money, uh, but determining the hydrology is the most critical elements in these projects. If you don't have the hydrology, you really don't have a project. So if you don't have hydrology, then you just, it's time to move on to the next project. Uh, uh, and that's really, uh, the most critical element of these projects that I found, uh, because obviously we've uh, been in operation for a number of years now, and we're dealing with uh, a number of issues related to the original construction of the project that have sort of set us back a little bit, but it's just the process that we have to deal with. 
uh, but it has given us uh, some really good learning experiences along the way and, and, and uh, developing and building capacity at the local level with our chief and council, who, I who obviously I report to, uh, but also we have a neat, neat board that I report to as the CEO of the, the UPIC, uh, uh The general partner, the uh, UPIC Power Limited Partnership Agreement is UPIC Power Corp. Uh, UPIC Power Corp is essentially myself, our chief financial officer, and uh, we have two uh, plant technicians that uh, operate the plant uh, during the course of operation. Typically, we shut down for two to three months of the year, uh, but the hydrology in the rainfall obviously has changed. It's ironic. I was at a conference in Toronto about two weeks ago on, on water, water and climate change, and uh, certainly those in that field are, are looking forward and saying that we'll have more rain, less, less snow, uh, and that will impact uh, these projects going forward. And certainly that's one of the things that we've seen most recently with uh, China Creek. Last year uh, we produced power in every month of the year, which is really scary uh, because we need downtime to do some maintenance of the, the turbines and the, and the generators and other elements that are part and parcel of this project. But we're very happy with where we're at right now and that's given us a lot of uh, sort of insights into how we approach the other projects in terms of the partnerships that we have uh, the financing related to these projects, as well as other uh, uh, initiatives that are out there to support this. The Clean Energy Act, uh, if some of you are familiar with that, the province of British Columbia uh, enacted uh, the Clean Energy Act, which that's the heat and care program that's part of that process. Uh, but it also set out uh, some other elements in terms of BC Hydro. Uh, just to talk a little bit about that, and the other, on another note is I'm I've been asked to sit on uh, BC Hydro's Technical Advisory Committee for the Integrated Resource Plan. Uh, I know it's quite a mouthful just describing the committee, uh, but we have been at that for about a year and a half now, and uh, we, were to, we were scheduled to finish about eight months ago, but there were some issues uh, with, the, with the province that sort of changed uh, the mandate and changed other things. Uh, uh, that the committee was looking at. So we're, the integrated resource plan is looking out to 2040 and 2020 in terms of what the power demands are going to be for this province. And of course, the sustainability element is kind of out the window. Uh, the sustainability element is really just getting the northeast of this province onto BC's grid. Easier said than done because it's 500 kilometers of new wire to the northeast of this province at a cost of about $2 billion. So there's a considerable amount of debate among the committee as far as that whole sustainability side of things. But what the Clean Energy Act does say is that 93% of our power going forward has to be clean and green. And there's a definition of clean and green, of course, biomass, tidal power, wind power, wave power. All of those elements are thrown into, into the hopper, if you will, and projected forward in terms of what the growth of the power demand is going to be for this province going forward. And what we're seeing by the mid-2020s is that the gap will start to widen. Um, the gap really is about what's clean and green power versus uh, gas and oil. Uh, the unfortunate side of it is by the time we get to 2040, we're going to be about, if we maintain the 93% uh, uh, clean and green power, we're going to be about four to 5,000 megawatt hours short of power. So gas at some point will we'll need to uh, fill in that gap, especially in the mid 2020s when electrification kicks in and when there's more electric cars and buses and so on. It's all the load that goes onto the grid. So, so BC Hydro is doing the best that it can in terms of looking forward, looking where the power is going to come from. And, and obviously uh, the demand side management of that is a significant uh, element to, to, to the planning process because we need to know where the wire is going. Uh, who the consumers are and how much they're consuming. Uh, the smart meter program and other elements that Hydro is doing is all about really tracking people in terms of their power consumption because you know we know uh, we have built into our energy purchase agreement uh, adjustments uh, for peak hours and super peak hours uh, because BC Hydro knows and we know when there's a big spike in the power demands. Uh, when that happens and we're producing power, we get a little bonus. So uh, it works out pretty well at the end of the day. Uh, I know we said I only had 10 minutes, Tom. I hope uh, you would uh, remind me if I'm going over. So, I have, uh, do you want to do the questions after or after everyone else? Or? Okay. 
So I'll leave it at that. And if there are any questions, obviously uh, I'll, I'll do my best to answer uh, when the other speakers are done. Look forward to hearing from them. And thank you again for the invitation and look forward to your comments and your questions. Thank you. Well, I think uh, Bob's ancestry obviously has to be killer whale because uh, if he can do this without taking a breath for 45 minutes, it's not the raven. Um, and I think he did a fabulous job, actually, of setting up the idea of uh, community engagement, involvement in development. Development of... of uh, some of these renewable power projects. Can we put it on full screen? Um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about some of the community scale marine projects uh, later on in this. Uh, Got to have some pictures. Uh, title is driven entirely by uh, gravitational forces. Anyone who lives here uh, understands the uh, vagaries of, of the, and the power of the tide. We'll go on. Um, and just some pictures of some of the technologies that are being worked with to harvest that energy from the tide. Uh, wave energy is, the ocean is a, our biggest solar collector, and essentially that, uh, that energy accumulates in the winds, which then transfer energy into the waves, and of course the waves crash on the shore. I'm astonished at the wave impact you've seen here this winter uh, in what is a relatively sheltered part of the water. But essentially the interesting wave is that it's delivering energy collected over very large parts of the ocean to the shoreline. And we have a number of different technologies that have been worked on in various parts of the world that are essentially capturing that kinetic energy in the wave. We're actually talking about three resources, the uh, tidal currents, river currents, and, and wave. We have a huge uh, opportunity in Canada in all of those areas, which actually is a unique capacity. Uh, and we see this as an opportunity to develop new coastal industries uh, for for the future, and we'll talk a little bit about jobs and careers sometime later on. Uh, ocean energy will be cost competitive uh, as it evolves. Uh, the energy densities compare so well against the the other renewable resources. We have to be very bad engineers or operators in order to to not use that energy density. The interesting thing, particularly in British Columbia, is that this is an opportunity to develop distributed generation. A number of small uh, tidal plants or wave plants throughout the coast would be a significant difference to the electricity system in, in British Columbia. And as I said at the beginning, there are community scale opportunities. We are dealing with climate change resistant tidal. Uh, climate change won't have an impact on tidal energy. We are dealing with wave energy, which is uh, uh, highly forecastable, and Brad may touch on this uh, in operational terms. We'd, we'd be able to forecast what the wave, wave energy is going to deliver. Next one. Um, our pitch to try to uh, move this forward is that it isn't simply an energy story. It's it's a new industry, and and so a blue field uh, development where uh, we can take our resources and build a new industry uh, with domestic and export uh, market opportunities. Bob talked about fuel switching. I don't think any of us have a clue how much the demand for clean electricity is going to go up over the next 25 years. Um, horrible slide, lots of words, and they're all too small. But we are, we are making significant progress, particularly in what's happening in Nova Scotia these days, uh, driven by government, uh, the utility and industry, academic research, all beginning to focus in in a very coordinated fashion on, on the opportunities for, uh, for wave energy in particular. 
And so probably the most significant thing that's happened in, in Canada in the last uh, year is the, the go-ahead on two community uh, feed-in tariff-supported projects for, for Tidal. In the world, we're looking at uh, uh, forecasts of um, 300,000 megawatts of installations by uh, 2050. And a couple of hundred thousand, if that goes ahead, a couple of hundred thousand careers that will be developed. This is not about the jobs created in installation. This is renewable energy where projects are developed, uh, installed, operated, and in fact renewed and, and repaired. So let's go on. Um, we've got an incubation system that has been set up in uh, Nova Scotia for large-scale tidal, the Fundy Ocean Research Center for Energy, or FORCE as they call it, four of the world-leading large-scale tidal uh, technologies, um, a bunch of strategic research uh, that have begun. Uh, based on the work they've done in force, Emera, the local utility, is moving forward with an initiative where they're trying to actually integrate all the phases of their developments into their own project, uh, which is freeing up an opportunity for another player to come into, into force. Um, now, the other thing that's going on in Nova Scotia is the government of Nova Scotia is seeing this as an industrial development strategy for the province. This is a new resource opportunity around which to create new economic activities, new careers, etc. So this year, we will actually have a strategy released by the Nova Scotia government that talks about this as a, an industrial development initiative. In River Current, this is an area where Canada has a, a uh, significant uh, state play at the moment. We have at least four Canadian technology companies that are developing these uh, generators for deployment in the river. And the interesting thing, of course, is that virtually every province and territory in Canada has river resources where the currents are high enough that you could deploy these generators in the rivers and, uh, and produce electricity. So uh, Manitoba Hydro is just as interested in this as uh, as is uh, Newfoundland or, or Nova Scotia. Let's go on. Wave energy experience. We've had a number of uh, very interesting wave energy technology uh, developments uh, that are suffering as many new technologies do from the difficulties of getting through the uh, financial challenges of the early days. And Brad will talk a little bit about the, uh, the work that's actually continuing on on value adding essentially to our knowledge and understanding of how the resource uh, is assessed and what our resources actually are in the west coast of the island. Last year we spent a lot of effort, a uh, hundred people probably across the country building a roadmap uh, that's essentially the key part that uh, I would leave with you today was the discussion in this roadmap was, was very non-Canadian. We actually found ourselves discussing whether Canada wanted to be the leader in marine energy development in the world or among the leaders. Uh, there was definitely no hint that we wanted to follow the development of marine energy in, in other countries. So a couple of pictures of, you'll see this one again probably or something similar, but these are real things in action in Canada. This one isn't Canada, but it does show you for Bob, who's running an active power plant, he would look at this and say, oh, why does it keep shutting down every six hours and 25 minutes or whatever? But that is the power curve out of the seaflow uh, uh, marine current turbines machine that's been operating in the ocean in Northern Ireland for the last uh, three years. And it does show you a very clear uh, I mean, it's an engineering output of, of the electricity coming off that machine. Flattens at the top because the machine actually shuts or manages its uh, power production at the peak of the flow of the tide. So uh, we need it. We need the energy for cl climate action choices. We need it for a developing economy. Lots of talk about new industrial activities, some in places where traditional electricity isn't available. 
this is what will sustain the families of, of British Columbia. And we're at a point where we really should make some long-term decisions in, the, uh, in, in order to do this. Um, Bob talked about the current integrated resource planning process. Two years ago, we were part of uh, the prelude to the current process where we were looking at the resource opportunities for renewables throughout the province. BC Hydro identified, I think, 15 different clusters of resources that can be developed uh, and could be powering this province over the next 50 years. And you'll notice there's some very big clusters that are actually on the coast of British Columbia and uh, wave and tidal are a significant contribution to, uh, to those. There are two of those zones on Vancouver Island, one of which is essentially centered on the North Island. And these spots actually show you some of the uh, resource opportunity sites that have been identified uh, for tidal. The, the purpley ones are, are, are representative of the hot spots. For wave, uh, it's more generic because essentially, in Brad will now contradict me, but in general terms, the wave resource on the outside of the islands is good from top to bottom, from the tip of Haida Gwaii all the way to uh, uh, to southern Vancouver Island. So Bob actually did a very nice job, I think, of talking about uh, how how BC Hydro has to be a significant player in, in how this all moves forward. Uh, they have to be the resource that integrates these uh, power productions into the grid and distributes it to the market. Um, they are the mechanism that, will, that does deliver the standard offer program and hopefully will deliver the feed-in tariff program, although that seems to have been pushed somewhat into the future. So there we are. That's the end of my story. Thank you very much. Um, quick survey before I get going. How many people, uh, Chris, Clayton, Tom, and David, and Andrew are out of the survey? How many people can put their hand up that they can envision a wind energy converter or a wind turbine? You close your eyes, can you picture a wind turbine in your mind? Okay. How many people can put their hand up if I ask you if you can envision what a wave energy converter looks like? Wow, that's a spot. That's pretty good. <laughs> usually, usually no hands go up at the end, so I'll have to change the whole basis of my, my talk for the evening, so it sounds like you have a pretty good understanding already. I'll talk to you tonight about a project um, that's being run out of the University of Victoria. It involves a lot of other groups. Uh, it's called the West Coast Wave Initiative. There's a few acronyms in the talk today. The, we refer to it as a WCWI. Um, so, short talk. Um, there's a thing called the maximum of the five W's and one H. The story says that if you have 10 or 15 minutes to talk about something, it's a principle of journalism, that you better hit the five W's and the one H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So I think, taking a guess at what people might be interested in about our West Coast Wave Initiative, uh, the what's we're going to get at are what is wave energy, what's a wave energy converter, or what we call in the industry a WEC, uh, and what are the objectives of our project in relation to technology, the converters, and, and wave energy itself. Where, where are we doing our work? Uh, well, we're doing it at UVic, but where do we focus? Where are we looking? Uh, Chris just told you that wave energy is distributed equally all over, all over the world and gave you some very big numbers. In fact, if people talk about wave energy, they throw out terawatts, <laughs> which is a pretty astonishing statistic or big number, but what does that mean locally? Um, so where are we looking? When, uh, when did we get started? And the other little side question I think it's fun is when were WEX, when were these basic concepts invented? This is an innovative, trend. we call it a transformative energy technology, brand new. It's going to change the way we generate clean electricity if we can get around to, to making it happen. It's kind of funny to look when it got started. Why are we doing this? Who's funding us? I'd say who we are, but we're a fairly large collection of people uh, at UVic. I won't go into specific names, but who's providing the money for us to go ahead? And how are we actually going to contribute to WEC development? We're a foundational group. We're not making converters. We're not deploying cables in the water but we're doing what Chris mentioned was the value-added part. So we're trying to do the part that we think is the foundation for people to come in and do this. There are no commercial wave energy plants in the world. How did I do with that statement? Still bang on? 
I think you'd have to say they're still not commercial. There, there's some things in the water making power, but they're not a commercial. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, so I won't get into this too much. Chris already told you that people in the wave energy industry say waves are solar batteries. That's a way of saying that it's solar energy concentrated. That's a way of saying that wave energy is better than solar energy. That's a scheme. <laughs> so if you look at some basic statistics, the picture on the bottom right is saying if you look at an average square meter of surface on the ocean, you're going to get about a kilowatt of power transport from the sun. If you look at a wave front that is a meter wide off the coast of our island, on the worst day, it will be 10 kilowatts per meter wide. So one kilowatt per square meter of, of, of ocean surface from the sun, one meter front of wave, 10 kilowatts. That's a factor of 10 increase on the worst day. That's a little bit of spin, but it's mathematically true. So it gets better than that. Some days it's 100 times concentrated. Go ahead. Okay, so actually, Tom, can we go back one more? In the diagram at the top, one thing I'll just point out, and Chris has already showed this to you, when we talk about ocean swell, we're talking about waves that are coming in at 14, 15 second periods. So if you're in the little boat, you're going up and down very slowly, and there's a massive amount of, of water mass that's being elliptically transported in, and then it's going back out, and then it's going back in. So there's a lot of energy. But that wave has, there's lots of ways to interact with it. You can float on top of it, and the water buoyancy is gonna push you up and down. You can go underneath the surface of the water, and the elliptical motion of the fluid will drive, drive a turbine if you wanted to somehow fix one in there. So there's a number of ways that you can interact with the, the wave, and because of that, go ahead, Tom, there's a number of different concepts. So it's not a converged technology. There's no one way that people have decided to do this. How many people, when they envisioned the wind turbine, had a three or four bladed turbine sitting on a horizontal axis on a large white tower, gleaming in the sunshine, spinning round and round? There's other ones. There's vertical axis wind turbines, but nobody probably pictured that one. It's a relatively converged technology, not so in wave. So the little schematics on the right give you an idea. The top one, I guess this is a pointer. So the top one up here is Palamis. A lot of them have really good names too. The mighty whale, Palamis, which is Greek for sea snake or sea serpent. Um, then there's other ones down here called oyster. And there's one called limpet, which don't really evoke images of powerful structures. But uh, Palamis or the sea snake is an articulated one. It's called an attenuator. It's like a bunch of collected cans that are floating on the ocean. And as the wave goes by, they kind of bend and flex. And as they bend and flex, you get relative motion at the joint of two of the floating cans, and that relative motion drives a power takeoff. You have to have a power stroke to drive an energy generator. You've got to have motion. You've got to make one thing move with respect to the other, and that's what wave energy is all about. So if you go down to a device that, that the type that I like to work on, a point absorber, it's something floating on the surface of the ocean, and it's going up and down. And in fact, if you put two of these bodies next to each other and you design them differently, they go up and down differently. They move with respect to one another. They can drive a piston. They can compress a hydraulic ram. They can uh, compress air. They can generate an energy commodity provided you have relative motion. So various ways to do that. They're all installed in different locations. And the people who design these want to know what the waves look like. How many people have gone off to Pino or gone on a boat anywhere off the coast of the island? Different days, different waves, different directions, different amounts of Dramamine or gravel depending on, on the day. So if you can imagine a device that's interacting with those waves, you need to know what's going on. You need to know how it changes. And it's statistical. There's no one set condition. There's all kinds of conditions. And you want to work either in some of them really well, or you want to work in all the conditions fairly well. That's a strategy. OK, go ahead, Tom. All right, so this is a point absorber when you look under the water. This is a device made by a company called Ocean Power Technologies. Uh, they're in New Jersey. So um, you've got two bodies. One of them is this. And I've had about six cups of coffee today little jittery in the laser pointer. So there's a very buoyant toroid here, a very buoyant float, very shallow draft, and it's sitting concentrically on a very long spar buoy, which has this damper plate at the body, at the bottom. And that float up here can basically oscillate up and down with respect to that long, slender piece. It's relative motion. One of them has got the damper plate at the bottom to try and hold it stationary, to try and make it not move. And then there's a mooring arrangement around the whole thing to try and keep it in one spot. And the very buoyant piece, as the waves are going by, you want that to go up and down with the waves. So you've got one body not moving, one, one going up and down. You have relative motion. You can drive a PTO. Um, you can see in the diagram on the right, that's it on a dock. And you can see the, the mechanical lifts here give you an idea of, of how big this thing is. That's a 150 kilowatt unit. That's 0.15 megawatts. So Bob already mentioned the, the, the China Creek was 6.5 megawatts. This is 0.15 megawatts. And that's the size of the structure you're looking at. So it's clean, but it seems relatively mass intensive. If you look at wave converters in general, it's about a kilowatt per ton of material. 
ballast included. So 150 kilowatt machine is about 150 tons of material. So if you're not in the wave industry, you say, wow, this is huge. And if you're in the wave industry, then you say, well, if you look at a hydroelectric dam, we've got to look at the three gigawatts that come off of, I don't know, one of the dams up in you know, the northeast. And now you have to count all the tonnage that's in the dam wall, and you have to count all the tonnage that is in the water behind the dam wall that wasn't there before you put the dam in. And now we're getting back towards kilowatts per ton. Okay, So in, in that respect, it's comparable. Okay. All right, so um, <clears throat> what are we trying to do? Well, mathematically, if you're planning, and we talked about, Chris mentioned scheduling, how do you represent a wave energy converter if you're a utility? Well, that converter I just showed you reduces down conventional practice into this grid of numbers. It's called a P matrix, which is a power matrix or a performance matrix. It's a lookup table. So if you're BC Hydro, on the bottom axis here, the numbers are telling you what the periods of the waves are, and then the vertical axis is telling you what the heights. If the periods get big, more energy. Heights get high, more energy. And so there's two ways you can improve the performance. The periods might get long and you have very shallow waves or you have large waves, short period. Statistically, not all of these conditions occur. You're never going to have a four second wave that's eight meters in significant wave height. That would be a wall, a literal wall of water falling on top of you in the ocean, which would not occur. So inside each of those cells is a power number. So for example, down here, this is 4.8, 4.6. I can't tell from here. That's a kilowatt value. So if the periods and the wave heights put me in that cell, this is my power output. But there's a ton of ambiguity in that. That number says that I'm going to give you constant output at a rate of 4.6 kilowatts. But the problem is, what are the conditions? If I'm a utility, I don't know what the periods of the waves are going to be at 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, or what the wave heights are going to be. Or a week later on another Sunday, what are the wave heights and periods going to be? So that uncertainty leads to ambiguity in the estimates. That leads to dismissal of, of wave energy in place of things that are more certain okay okay so the other part is is that even if you had or even if somebody came to you with these numbers and I'll go over this one quickly usually they haven't measured the conditions so the plot on the right is actually some of our work and the red dots without getting into what this is too much this is basically a wave spectra so on the bottom axis this is the frequency of the waves so if you go out to the right hand side those are high frequency waves and at the bottom end here, these are low frequency waves. And then the curves are the heights of the blue curve and the red stems tells you something about the height. So the red work is us doing calculations I'll talk about in a second. Those are real calculations saying at a point off the coast at a certain time, that's what was happening. The general way of, of modeling these things is with the blue curve. So that's, that's a, some, a statistical summary that people like to use without going into what that is. And you can see that the blue curve and the red dots don't match. Can you guess which set of data people use to generate power matrices for converters? They use the modeled stuff. They use the blue curve. So they're not using real wave data. So now not only is the number they're getting, not only do you know or not know what the conditions are, even if you knew what the conditions are, they probably actually were what you think they were. So we have this massive knowledge gap in that we don't know what the conditions are off the coast. Okay. Okay, so where are we working? Where are we trying to improve the knowledge of what the conditions are? Well, that's our world. That model grid that you see, that's a computer model of the west coast of Vancouver Island, or what we call WCVI for short, because we get lazy writing west coast of Vancouver Island all the time. Um, the colors you see are depth contours, and all the little lines and the node points you see are our model nodes. So at all of those spots, we are starting in the fall of 2011, trying to track what the wave conditions are. So what the frequencies of all the different waves are at those spots, what their directions are, and we're trying to do that every three hours. Um, we have a second model grid, which is a much smaller model. It's a rectangle, and that's the red, uh, the red one I've shown. I can't really see it from here. Up in this area, and that's up in Hesquiet Sound, north of Tofino. So we have two areas. That's an area of focus for us. Uh, can you go ahead there? We also have two wave buoys. One of them is deployed at Amphitrite Bank, and the other one is uh, deployed inside the Hesquiet Sound grid, inside our finer scale grid where we do calculations. So we do two sets of calculations. And what we try to do is use the calculations from the larger grid that's colored there and use those to, to drive the conditions on the outside of our smaller model. And then the smaller model tells us at very fine resolution what's going on in Hesquiet Sound. Okay, great. So this is the type of data we collect off of the buoys. That's an Amphitrite Bank. Vertical scale is, is height in meters. There's two curves there. One of them is significant wave height, or H sig. The other one is H max, that is maximum wave height. Significant wave height is, you could think of it as, a, as a, an average wave height. It's the height you would, if you were sitting out in the ocean still, that you would estimate the waves to be, even though it's an irregular collection that's, that you're seeing come by. 
Um, you'll notice that on January 21st, this is in 2010, we peaked out maximum wave at around 15 meters. That's a 50 year condition. That is supposed to be a 50 year wave. You're only supposed to see that once every 50 years. And the problem for us is that Amphitrite Bank, it's basically like a 50 car pileup on a highway. It's a very funny region for waves. It's very shallow water that's surrounded by very deep water and the waves pile up. Our, the, the water depth where our buoy is, is 40 meters. And we have 15 meter waves that come across this thing every year. So you can imagine 40 meters of water and you're going up and down by 15 meters. So the wave steepness gets pretty hard or pretty high. We've had years where trees are getting dropped on top of our buoy and then we have to go and bring it back in. So go ahead. Okay. So that larger scale model, that's actually a more resolved picture of the mesh. So you can see there are a lot of nodes. Um, I won't get into this too much, but we use software that exists. It was made at a university in the Netherlands. But it's all about implementation. It's about customizing it to your region, feeding it with all the inputs it needs. What, what are the depths at all those node points? What are the conditions on the offshore boundaries? So the red dots are basically the inputs that we have to feed into this thing every three hours. And then the model basically propagates those offshore wave conditions to shore, and we start to resolve how the waves are refracting, bending, diffracting around little islands, all of that detail all of that precision that we want to see in the description of the resource so that we don't have this ambiguity in the discussion on what a wave energy converter is going to do. Okay. All right, so this is the finer scale grid. I've given you the big model with the red rectangle down here just to remind you. And this is just some preliminary calculations we did last year with the finer scale model. The colors are showing you energy. That's energy accumulated over the year at each spot. Uh, the red values on the, on the legend on the right-hand side, you can see that there's some, some red values. Red would mean hot or lots of energy. They occur in a tiny little region on the north side of Hesquia Peninsula. You can't even really see it in this plot. So the cyan colored, the lighter blue is the higher energy area. So Chris told you, <laughs> I have proof, <laughs> Chris told you that it's relatively, you know, it's, it's out there. It's sight unlimited is what the wave energy converter people will, will say. And I'm a wave energy converter person. I'm, it, it, Relatively, it is sight unlimited. You can go in the ocean and find wave energy. But you can see that there's detail in where that energy accumulates. And you can move a matter of kilometers, and you're going to have a 40 to 50% change in the amount of energy that's coming in. And nobody knows this. You and I are the only people, and some people at BC Hydro that said it was okay for me to show you this, that have seen that plot. So it's not published anywhere yet. So that, that type of detail is missing. So it seems pretty astonishing that we could have a wave energy industry without that type of detail being prevalent, without everybody being able to draw on that to pick the location for chemicals. Okay. All right, so when, so that's where we're looking, when were concepts invented? Um, this is a patent from 1924, and this is text I ripped from the patent. Um, you cannot bring me a wave energy converter patent that I can't find something from the 17, 18, or early 1900s that shows the exact same thing. And that does not mean it's not a challenge to make a unique wave energy converter. I just said there's no commercial plans. I said that a little while ago. There's lots of challenges. It's a real accomplishment, but it's not conceptual. It's in the implementation. It's the making it survive, the making it work in salt water. So, you know, Fred basically said that this relates to wave motors, he called it. And he said that you were going to have a buoy, which is the round ball, which he said was going to go up and down with the wave, and you were going to have a stator or a fixed reference that this thing was going to slide on. And as it slid on that stator, you have relative motion, he was going to make power. So this little plate down here, that's a damper plate that's down below the surface of the water, down where the water is still. It's trying to keep the stator in one spot. Okay, one click and one more click. Well, that's OPT. <laughs> it's the same thing. So that round ball is that yellow float. That stator, that long slender piece that the round ball is floating on with a flat plate, that's that big black thing. Look at the look at the mooring structure. I mean you've got a they have a surface float going down to an anchor. You guys have subsurface floats going down to anchors and then horizontal lines keeping the same position. It's almost like they copied it. Right? And this gets repeated over and over. So this is not new. This is not voodoo or witchcraft. This has been around for a long time, but still hasn't been implemented. Okay. So when did we get going? Um, we or, or my team, I guess, was born back in 2009 with a project called the West Coast Wave Collaboration Program. Uh, there's other people, David King is here, he's involved in that program. Uh, lots of people were involved in that program. We had oceanographers, we had consultants, we had UVic researchers, we had wave energy companies, we had federal agencies, and everybody was pitching in a little bit to try and make uh, some seed work occur. 
And the seed work was in building this model, which we're now in a position to execute in our larger scale initiative moving forward to build this precision in the description of what's actually going on. So that project was about building the model, deploying the buoys, and if you look at those two activities, we were able to do some model validation. So that's a sample of a plot we can make that says, well, here's what the model said, here's what the buoy said, how confident are we in the model? The buoy gives us a pinprick of data, the model gives us a ream, terabytes of data a week on what's going on in the ocean. So we need computer models. We can't put three million buoys off the coast of the island. Navigable Waters Canada would have a fit. Everybody would have a fit if we put that many buoys off the coast. So we have to try and fill this in numerically. Yeah. Okay, so why is what we're doing important? Well, if we go back earlier on our objectives, it was actually a question I didn't get into, and I, I said that we're trying to answer three questions. I'm going too fast, so I missed the, the question earlier. There's three questions we were trying to answer. How big is the resource and where is it? What kind of converters should we use and where should we put those converters? And I said we were going to try and answer those questions as precisely as possible. So when Chris gets up and passes on his ream of knowledge on ocean energy and tells you there's terawatts of wave power out there, which is entirely 100% accurate, we have to complement that with a locally relevant fixture that in the short term we can use to help people take a step towards getting to the terawatts. So when you get to the coast of the ocean, you stand at your clue and you look and go, wow, now what? So that's where we step in and try and fill in the blank. So trying to initiate transformational change. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, so again on the why, this is basically what exists today. This one, a lot of people here might have seen. This is from the Ocean Energy Atlas, which was great work. The red dots are basically a map of the wave energy off the coast of BC. Bigger red dot, more wave energy. And where I want you to focus is down here where it says 32. So that red dot basically indicates that in that part of our ocean, we've got 32 kilowatts per meter of wave crest. You take a 10 meter wide converter, you're going to get 320 kilowatts of raw resource. If you look at this, you would say, wow, we know a lot. We know a lot of information. Well, so how geographically dispersed is it? I mean, the coastline of Vancouver Island, I'm going to guess it's about 400 kilometers. So this dot out here, this one out here, these are like 300, 400 kilometers offshore. <laughs> I could build the world's best wave energy converter. DC Hydro is not going to build subsea cable 400, 500 kilometers offshore so I can go get that power. So those are off the board. And a lot of those points are off the board. They're too far out. Let's go one slide. So 32 kilowatts per meter. That little rectangle that just popped up there, that's our fine scale grid. That rectangle I showed you before, one more time. That's the data I showed you out of that rectangle. That's our best estimate of one synthetic year. That's the best characteristic year we can come up with to date. And I'm showing you the energy distribution in that rectangle. And it's varied. Like it's way more varied than that red dot is indicating. So we got hotter numbers here. We got hot spots on the north side of Hesquit Sound. We did some preliminary work where we actually looked at deploying a converter, and so the plot at the right is basically looking at a subset of the ocean. It's the ocean where the depth is greater than 40 meters, because we were working with a company whose converter had to sit in water that was more than 40 meters. So we started looking in at deployment locations, and the one we picked was right here. And if you go to the next slide, Tom, one more time, and one more time. It's okay, it's not you, that slide. If you go to that site over the course of that synthetic year, here's the power transport on a daily basis. It's that black curve going up and down. And the red dot, which was right beside that rectangle that's in our only published work on what the resource is, said that the resource was 32 kilowatts per meter. And on the side here, I'm giving you kilowatts per meter as well, and 32 would be around the elevation of the red dot. So is the resource 32 kilowatts per meter? No, it's not even close. It's a useless, it's a general number, it's accurate in an annual mean sense, but this plot shows you the problem with wave energy. It's there. I mean, we're peaking out at numbers over here that are around, you know, 500 kilowatts per meter. So what's the right number? So the red line is giving you monthly averages, okay? And then the other problem or the other thing we can do is that if you're a device developer, if we come into July 9th and we come down, that plot I showed you earlier with the wave spectra, that's the wave spectra that occur, occurred at deployment location three on July the 9th of our best, best year, our best estimate of what would happen on July the 9th. So we can feed that information through. And that's only one year, that's not enough. To track wave energy, you gotta look at multiple seasons. So we have to do this over you know, years in, in advance. We gotta build a database, a hindcast, so to speak, of what the resource is. And that's what that resource would be. So who's put into this? I've just shown you cash contributions today. There's a number of people who've put valuable in kind and time in. So Natural Resources Canada is our biggest funder. 
Fred Olson Marine Renewables was a company that actually had an investigative use permit at Amphitrite Bank where our buoy is. So they were very keen on getting buoy data, so they provided uh, money for this. They've since pulled back. That was one of the projects Chris mentioned that has financial difficulties holding it, holding it back. And at present, the West Coast Wave Collaboration Program has ended and we've kind of grown up into this initiative. We're funded by NSERC, so the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. So we have about $420,000 to use over three years to try and carry this out. And we're going to wait to hear on a request for $1.7 which would allow us to do this not just with a fluctuating population of students. I'm an academic. I work at a university. I don't actually do anything other than talk about what we want to do and what our objectives are. It's actually done by people in the trenches, the students. They come and go every two years. It makes it very hard for us to stay consistent and move forward. So hopefully we can supplement them with the professional staff that are dedicated to, to generating this data. Okay, um, why, well, how can we contribute? So that's the resource, but we're going to skip this one, Tom, and go to the next one to finish off. What's the end goal? I mean, why? what can we do other than gather resource data to try and lay a foundation for an industry? Um, Clayton's going to talk to you about tidal energy in a second, and, and tidal or hydrokinetic? Either or. He's going to talk about actually doing real work with real equipment and putting things in the real world and how hard it is to do that. Robert's already mentioned the word frustration, the F word, with permitting, environmental assessments, et cetera, et cetera. We live in a computer world, and I said how we have to use computer models because they're comprehensive. Look at all the grid points that we can get data at. It might be 90% right, which means it's 10% wrong, but it's still 90% accurate, which is way better than nothing. It's astonishingly better than nothing. In fact, 90 over zero would be as far as I can tell, an infinite improvement over what we know at most of these locations. We've already got an ability on Vancouver Island to do really good work simulating these technologies. We can actually simulate the full converter motion, mooring cables, everything in. We can simulate the interactions of the fluid and the converter. We can do time domain models. We can actually watch the thing in computer react. We can simulate the power takeoffs, no matter what they are. We can simulate the community infrastructure that's taking the power back. The problem has been is we can't drive computer simulations because we didn't know what the conditions were. Why bother running years worth of simulations when you're guessing what the waves were that were actually driving the simulations? And you couldn't prove they were right anyway. So now that we've filled in that blank, we've got a virtual coastline that we can deploy a converter in via simulation. The other work that goes on at UVic I haven't talked about is actually building those numerical models. We have to do experiments, and we have to do other numerical work to try and make sure the simulations of the technology are right. So that's the pictures at the top left. So that's ongoing as well. We piece all that together. Maybe we can lay the foundation for somebody to come in and be accepted to do a demonstration or move to a commercial stage. And that should be, if I've done this right, it. Hopefully I'm not too far over 10 minutes. In terms of conclusions, the main thing here is at the bottom. We're trying to build, we're neutral of any technology. We're at arm's length from any technology developer. We don't have a, a golden elephant that we cherish, if that's the phrase. We're just trying to build the foundation for those people who have those concepts to come in and have the foothold or the toehold they need to prove that there actually is a potential there. We need to remove the ambiguity and remove any uh, ill-founded negative perception. If there's a reason why something should be evaluated negatively, we'll find it, <laughs> but it'll be based on real data, not on a perception. And that's it. Good. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Clayton Bear. Uh, I'm the President and CEO of uh, New Energy Corporation. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, tell you a little bit about uh, our company and our, our technology, and then and then and then talk about a project that we are in the process of, of undertaking here in the uh, in the Campbell River area. So New Energy uh, is a developer of uh, of uh, what we call in-stream or hydrokinetic or tidal uh, power generation equipment. Uh, we, we build this equipment uh, for sale or we also are involved in developing projects. Uh, our technology is, is focused on what we call a vertical axis, uh, what we call our end current uh, vertical axis turbine. Uh, and, and we are developing it for fresh and saltwater applications. So we, we have done a number of, of river and canal uh, type applications, and we are now working on uh, uh, tidal applications. And the size, size range of our equipment is, is from uh, the smallest of uh, 5 kilowatts per, per system 
to the largest size that we're currently working on is 250 kilowatts per unit, but in the future we could uh, go larger than that. However, the, the development costs are, are, are a, a, a geometric function of the size of, of equipment that you're developing because, as was mentioned previously, this equipment is physically very large. The applications uh, include any any anywhere you've got a moving stream of water and you've got the kinetic energy of that water, uh, uh, rivers, canals, industrial outflows, and of course the the tides. This is uh, our uh, typical five kilowatt turbine, just to give you just to give you an idea of of the size of this equipment. And that's the, the turbine, uh, which uh, that's how, actually how it sits in the water, with the turbine in the water. And above that is the, the powertrain, the gearbox, and, and generator. This is a larger uh, unit, uh, 25 kilowatts uh, being, being deployed. And this is that same unit in operation. And I, I think with the with the lights here, I don't think we're going to see the the video, but we'll give it a try. I can see it on here, but I don't think we can. It's there you can see it. Can you see it, train? Okay. That's right. Yeah! Look at the You guys were excited because this was the first time we got that size of uh, unit operating. We'll just move on from that one. Uh, this is another unit, a uh, slightly larger size. Uh, it's, it's still a 25 kilowatt unit, but it's what's called a low flow. So you see that it's, it's once again, is, is physically larger. Um, the amount of energy that you can pull out of the water is, is, a, is a function of the cube of the velocity. So if you start looking at sites that have a, a lower uh, velocity and therefore a lower energy density, the size of the equipment uh, starts to increase uh, pretty quickly. That's a nice picture because that's actually at midnight. Land of the midnight sun. This is another project that we did. This is in a canal. This is two 25 kilowatt units in a canal in India. So that's a basically a, 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 just a quick look at, at, at the equipment and, and how it operates. Uh, so then I wanted to focus on, on the project that we're doing here locally. Um, back in 2004, uh, I was approached by uh, a local longtime resident, uh, Thor Peterson, uh, about the possibility of doing a project uh, at a location called Canoe Pass, which is about, uh, I think, nine kilometers uh, north of, of, of Campbell River, uh, right next to Seymour Narrows. Uh, so we decided we, that we would actually... Uh, Undertake this project and see if we could uh, we could uh, do a tidal demonstration project at the at the canoe canoe pass site. And just a little ba background, you can see in in the picture a causeway across the channel. Well, that's a man-made causeway that was installed back I think in the 40s. And so basically, what we're going to do is 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 remove a section of that causeway and, and install some equipment. So that was back in 2004. 2005, we, we got an application in for for uh, some some grant money and started work on the on the project itself, on um, getting the approvals to do the project and get the financing in place and, and so on. This project is a, a 500 kilowatt uh, project, just half a megawatt, two 250 kilowatt units. Um, the advantage of, of this site was that because the causeway is there, we could do the installation in a still water environment. So that you know, in the tidal application, you know, you you've got to be cognizant of the fact that every six hours the tide uh, comes in, and reverses, and then and then comes in again. So uh, we thought this was a great site. Um, 
we started the permitting process and and currently we are still projecting that the installation of this equipment and site work will start in the second half of this year but that depends on on uh, uh, getting some final approvals uh, both for, from uh, environmental assessment perspective and then and then the permits this is an overhead uh, aerial view of, of the site on the bottom is is uh, is Maud Island and then just above above that is uh, is is Quadra and you can see the small causeway in between the two in the, between the two islands only access to that site is is by boat or chopper This is an overlay uh, as part of the part of the permitting process. This is an overlay of the installation on that particular site. Basically, we have to uh, remove the causeway and install the equipment just on one side of it, just for for practical purposes. I don't think that shows up particularly well, but that's just a, an actual drawing of the of the site. Point, how does this point out? Um, so, so this is where the this is this is these are the units here, the two units, and then over here is a is a is a yard where we can do the assembly and and, and staging and, and so on. This is just a conceptual model of what what those two units would look like in the water. We'll have a a, a bridge uh, across the across the channel and two bays where these uh, the two turbines uh, reside. This is actually uh, a, an actual model of the of the channel uh, that was used to to for resource assessment purposes. So there's been a lot of modeling work done to see uh, you know what the impact of of installing this equipment is at at the site, and also um, how much power we can get out and 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 what occurs upstream and downstream. Of the of the of the causeway once we once we install the equipment and this is a this is just gives you an indication that the the, the top the top uh, graph is is uh, is as the water is flowing in from Seymour Narrows into the into the bay and then of course the bottom one is in the reverse direction and we did a lot of modeling of, of the area there is a dive site in the area and also a fish farm and it appears that uh, Certainly, from our modeling, that neither of those sites will be negatively impacted, and perhaps even will be positively impacted by having some some uh, water flow through the area. There are some firsts with this project. Uh, it's a first in-stream tidal pilot in BC uh, that is undertaking a complete project cycle, uh, going through all the consult consultations, um, getting the approvals. Because there's federal money involved, uh, it triggers the, the uh, uh, Can Canadian Environmental, Environmental Assessment Act. Uh, the, the area had to be um, rezoned uh, and and uh, and go through a tenuring process. Um, and this is the first grid-connected tidal power demonstration project, uh, certainly in BC and. And, and perhaps in Canada. So our objectives of the project were that we wanted to prove the viability of, of, of our equipment in an ocean environment. Uh, we wanted to create a model of the project review and permitting process. And then of course we wanted to demonstrate the reliability of tidal power as an energy source. We feel that this, this equipment uh, has very little impact on the environment. And this is another thing that we wanted to demonstrate. And, uh, and another very important uh, aspect of the project is that we wanted to use as much uh, local uh, resources as possible and and in fact, have this as the beginning of, of, of developing, um, you know, a cluster on the on the west coast 
uh, of, of expertise and, and skill sets and, and eventually, you know, develop a very thri you know, thriving uh, industry. And, and really, Canada is, is, is a natural for this because of the tides that we have on, on three coasts. So, so, so hopefully this is actually uh, something that, that really develops into a long-term benefit for uh, uh, a location such as, as Campbell River. As far as the schedule of the project goes, um, there are six stages. Doesn't really matter which each of those stages are. The first one really is just uh, the, the regulatory and permitting process. And as you can see, that's basically the longest time frame of any of the stages in the project. Quite frankly, that's been, been a real challenge for us because there really aren't any, um, well, this is the first. There, there's, there's, there are no comparable projects that have, have been undertaken and, and the process is not, has not been created and developed for a project like this. So we found it to be very uh, complex, very expensive. This is a half a megawatt project. We've spent a million dollars already and, and at least three years, and we don't have the approvals yet. But uh, even so, there are no contentious issues that have been identified. We are not aware of any, any, any issues that are, that are, uh, that are really of, of concern. It's simply the process and how long it takes. So for a small half a megawatt project, you know, that creates, uh, that creates some challenges. So we really want to do this project. We're really excited about it. Hopefully we can get our, our approvals very soon and, and, and start to actually execute the physical project. And uh, we're really looking forward to it. And we're really looking forward to working with as many local resources as, as we possibly can. And that's it. Well, there you have it. A full, uh, full overview of uh, innovation advances and technology deployment here on Vancouver Island. Just like to open the floor now to the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, do I have a question or two? I have a question. Chris. Challenges around policies. Uh, Clayton hinted at it. Uh, is there a system in BC and Canada that uh, uh, projects like Clayton's can uh, can 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 uh, can um, attend or, or present their cases to to Ottawa if it, if it is Ottawa or into um, into uh, into Victoria? Yes, if you can, please. Um. There isn't really a national traction for for these kinds of things. Um, electricity is essentially a provincial, uh, or energy is a provincial responsibility. Uh, so, so the federal government has a habit of, of ducking these things, uh, except when they get really cornered with things like the uh, uh, eco energy incentive that was put there to to try and invigorate the, uh, the generally the renewable energy sector uh, and we're actually trying to raise the issue with the federal government that it isn't simply the large projects that are very difficult to manage through the permitting processes that in fact strategically important small projects like half a megawatt uh, are faced with an extraordinarily uh, uh, complex, variable um, process that almost changes. One of the problems we have with the Canoe Pass project is that all of the officials that they've been dealing with have actually moved. They're, we're dealing with completely new crop of people uh, across the uh, government agencies, and, and these processes tend to restart every time someone new gets involved. So this is an issue. It's particularly complicated. Any of you know anything of the history of uh, the aquaculture industry or the, uh, the cruise ship terminal 
project development, every marine project is dramatically more complicated than any terrestrial project in terms of the number of uh, permitting agencies that we have to deal with. In other nations, we've seen in Scotland, for instance, uh, they've established Marine Scotland as as the uh, single coordinating agency to uh, to manage the uh, siting, the evaluation of resources, so that the siting is is appropriate to the development and, and things like that. In Nova Scotia, what they permitted the force project in six months, which has to be a record for any marine uh, marine project not just a marine energy project. And they did that because the government of Nova Scotia said, we're going to have a problem. Let's try to manage this problem. And they brought all the federal and provincial regulatory agencies into one round table and said, now how do we do this? What do you all need to know in order to meet your regulatory responsibilities? And uh, with one exception, Transport Canada, uh, reserved the right to do an end run if they wanted to, but essentially that that worked. We have tried to uh, precipitate the same kind of approach in British Columbia without success, and, and we really do need to try and do something like that uh, in order to to manage this. And I mean, I hope the problems that have, have plagued the Canoe Pass project are are the first, but hopefully the last. It's not an easy thing to do something new like this. Permitting process for wave energy conversion technologies versus a tidal conversion technology. Well, Chris is going to nod here to confirm this for me, but there hasn't been. So Clayton's given you a sampling of a project where it's the first one going through the process, and in Canada there hasn't been process enacted for a wave energy converter. So what has been done is people have filed for investigative use permits in which they'll identify regions within provincial waters where they want to collect data uh, towards a purpose and they want the exclusive rights to get that data. And subsequent to that, you can apply for various licenses of occupation within that IUP or in the investigative use permit area where you could reside with your equipment for a finite period of time. And when that lease is up, then the equipment either comes out or you renew. And that's on the order of, I'd say that process, the first time through would be about $7,500, David, around around there, seven and a half to ten, going up higher. Depending on how many LOOs, on how many sites you want to occupy within that IUP, you pay per site. And I think an LOO site is like 500 square meters or something. It's not, not very large. It's a little dot within that IUP region. So we've gone through that with Fred Olson Marine Renewables because they had already started their investigative use permit around Amphitrite Bank. And I told you there was 15, 16 meter waves there. So Clayton and I were joking that developers pick the highest energy intensive environments because that's where the power is. But then you you know, I'm operating a buoy in that region right now. Fred Olson Marine has kind of moved on to other other avenues. And we're getting hammered every six months by waves that are the size of four or five story buildings. So, but that's why they wanted that area. They wanted exclusive rights to be in that area for that purpose. But nobody's actually deployed anything that is an actual converter long term. So the answer to that question, I don't I don't have for you. So yeah, which is I think where the value in what we do lies and that we can at least get somebody started. Somebody had a brilliant idea and that, that, that precarious permitting process, precarious is dependent on somebody else. It's dependent on somebody else getting the, the, the process together and, and, and executing it. You know, we can bypass that. We don't have the advantages of actually having the equipment in the water, but at least we're getting some numbers up and we're starting to look at the actual potential. And you're starting to put hard numbers on the table so that you can take it to the people who are in charge of the permitting process saying, this is the potential benefit. Is this a priority to us socially? If it is, Let's move on it. And now there's a motivation. Because right now there's no motivation. Because the promise is perceived. So, okay. okay. Brad, don't go away. I'd like to flag one other thing about UVIC, which is Neptune Canada, and how that project may be assisting your research as well on the West Coast. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no problems. Um, how many people are aware of what Neptune is? One, so a few. Okay, so very large-scale cabled underwater observatory. It's the World Wide Web on the continental shelf. Literally installed cables, sensors, terminals, power going from uh, Port Alberni, out Alberni Inlet, a network of cables to instrument clusters that are on the seafloor, data coming back live to Port Alberni, put on the World Wide Web, sent to a computer near you. You can actually log into the Neptune website 
uh, and view images that are being recorded off the Neptune Observatory at different nodes in 380 meters of water at different sites. There's a node off Bamfield. There's a node, um, I'm not a geologist or an oceanographer, but I can't remember the name of the region, but just off the continental shelf, the water depth drops down to hundreds of meters. There's a node there, and you can look at tube worms that are crawling around the camera. So, you know, that application per se, obviously no connection, but the technology that allows that, the power to go to that equipment from shore, and then that data to come back is obviously very interesting. And I know that there was the main, is it the main institute? Was it the main Ocean Energy Institute? There was a group in Maine that was communicating with Neptune about borrowing their technology, which is basically the terminals that all the devices plug into. That is a very particular design. It's supposed to be trawl proof. <laughs> I'm laughing. That gives you an idea of the evaluation of trawl proof design. <laughs> Nothing is trawl proof. Um, a trawl resistant. <laughs> um, so that design um, and all of the work that's gone into that, Ocean Works in Vancouver, who are a very you know, internationally renowned subsea robotics uh, agency, was involved in the design of that. So there's been an enormous number of man hours that are put into that. That, I think, is, could, could directly come over. And as well, in terms of the resource assessment, if we can put you know, upward looking ADCPs and run ADCP algorithms for decoding what the wave motions are, then yes. But even then, even with that web, you're looking at a finite number of locations, and we would still have to take, you know, we'd be looking at 15 to 20 data sets, we'd still have to surround that with a population of computer model generated data. Then, up here. Yeah, good question, Eric Smiley of North Island College. Uh, about the Vanna River project here. Robert's going to give an over overview. Robert, uh, I have had interest from New Zealand and Hawaii. So the First Nations communities on those islands are, are will be watching this. So if you could add, add a bit of information on that. Cool. Did I tell you I have uh, Hawaiian ancestry? That's nice. Uh, <clears throat> I do, really. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, at the end of the project, not a lot of jobs are created. But during the course of it, of course, uh, it, it's dependent on geography. Uh, as I said, if you're looking at a five or six kilometer penstock route, then you're really plowing through uh, a lot of earth and gravel to, to lay the pipe so that your water can flow down from the intake chamber into uh, obviously the powerhouse. Uh, that obviously takes a, a good deal of manpower, but we are looking at projects. Generally, that construction is, is less than a year. And in most cases, uh, we have to deal with fisheries issues, and I did have a actually had a question for Clayton with regards to that because one of the issues we deal with related to fish is uh, we have to mi minimize our impact on the environment and the footprint and all those other things. Uh, but when I look at pictures of the tar sands, I scratch my head. Uh, but that's just me. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, we have to deal with that constantly. In, in any system that has any kind of fish in it, we have to deal with it. And you have to have a mitigation plan to deal with that. And, and uh, so that's uh, obviously some of the frustration that we deal with uh, as a matter of course, but of course the hydrology is very important. And if it had fish in the system, then you have to deal with that element of it. So I know it's a bit of a departure from your question, but my question for Clayton is how are you dealing with fish? Uh, and the second second part of that, we've been approached by a company called Coastal Hydropower who are working with uh, a company out of France, uh, Malou, France, I believe, uh, who developed the DLTs, the very low head turbines. France's turbines turn very slow, fish can swim through them, and actually we've provided uh, a, a copy of the report uh, on the fish friendliness design of the DLTs. Uh, Ecofish, who's done a lot of work with us and in, in, in the business, will know that Ecofish does a lot of work for a lot of the IPPs throughout the province. So when you deal with fish, you have to mitigate any impacts on that and certainly anything else. Uh, Harlequin ducks is another frustrating story. Someone's seen ducks in, in the in the watershed, so we spent a year studying to determine whether there are any ducks in the China Treat uh, China Keep system. Nobody's seen any ducks after a year, but time and money was spent doing that. So a lot of consultants uh, at the other side of it, uh, we have to comply with our water licensing requirements on an annual basis. Uh, measuring water flows, water quality, water temperature, and obviously any impacts on fish and other aquatic life or, or birds for that matter. Uh, all of those elements are looked at, and that's why I said that the, the gamut of the approval agencies is massive, and, and that's the frustration part on our part in terms of moving these projects forward a lot quicker, and of course they do need to make dollars and cents. And the 
the very low height turbines that we're looking at, Clayton, are about a million dollars a pop, and they're 500 kilowatts each. So two of them make one megawatt. We look at it from the dollars and cents point of view. Uh, Great Central Lake, it's just a Stamp River Dam facility, for example. We know we have to deal with fish, significant amount of fish. Uh, so the conventional, and when we look at an Andritz uh, four, four megawatt bulb uh, microhydro system, uh, without a screen, it's economically viable, but with a fish screen, we're about a f almost a $40 million project that's going to generate 17 gigawatts of power on an annual basis. So the numbers go out of whack and we don't have a project. So uh, I, I just was curious of whether or not how you were dealing with fish. And certainly in our case with Great Central Lake and the Snap River Dam facility is installing uh, low head turbines. And of course, looking at less than five megawatts gets us in the door. Uh, with the feed and tariff program, which supposedly is supposed to be a higher base rate, but for a shorter period of time, and then tra transition into the conventional uh, standing offer program and the EPA with along associated with that. So, good luck with yours. Okay, so the, the the question was, how are we how are we dealing with with fish? Um, so um, there's a couple couple things I can I can uh, speak to. Uh, first of all, I had a I had a backup slide in my presentation that that showed a uh, a, a, a picture of a test uh, that was done in a in a test flume in in uh, in, uh, in I believe it was in Maine, a facility in Maine that uh, uh, was was for a uh, test that was commissioned by uh, EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute in the U.S. I think uh, uh, Department of Fisheries in, in Canada was also involved. Our role in that in that test was to provide a turbine that could be installed in a in a flume, and this flume was a um, basically a river directed through the facility, and some chambers in the side, and and uh, what the test involved was uh, releasing. Uh, uh, fish in various stages of their lives and also uh, at a time when they want to migrate and and releasing these fish and, and seeing what the what the beha their behavior was as they as they uh, encountered the turbine each of these fish were instrumented uh, with a with a transmitter so they could actually monitor and map where where all these fish were, were going at any at any given time uh, there is a report that, that has been produced on on, the, on those tests. I guess I can summarize by saying for the tests that were done, um, there was really no uh, fish mortality that could be attributed to uh, the fish uh, encountering the turbine. Their behavior, and if if you see the the see the slide, uh, the this was a, this was a pretty dramatic uh, uh, situation where the turbine basically covered most of the flume, so these fish really didn't have anywhere to go. But but basically through the turbine, well, when they came up close to it, they were, you know, they saw it and they they hesitated, and and perhaps they 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 tried to get around it. Um, uh, but but there was really no um, no mortality as a result of of these tests. So it was a very positive test. So that's on the on the technology itself. Uh, with respect to Canoe Pass, uh, these larger uh, turbines will rotate at about uh, about 15 RPM. Uh, fish can swim through them. Uh, they, uh, the, the turbine blades themselves uh, move at about two times the water speed. And there is there is uh, in in the large in the large units in the large installations there there is a there is a, a, a very large gap, you know it's in the order of of say um, uh, thirty centimeters or so. Uh, so so fish smaller than that can either get around the turbine or can swim through it. Uh, we've also been asked about, well, what about marine mammals? And we've even gone so far as to look at the speeds at which these mammals swim. And this is not a device that, that, that or an installation that, that sucks the water in. There's basically a, a positive pressure 
Uh, marine mammals can swim away from it, fish can swim away from it. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, what we're going to do at the site is we're also going to, to put in a, a, a screen or trash rack to make sure that, that, uh, that larger uh, creatures can't, can't get into the, into, the, uh, into the turbine chambers. We're going to monitor the site. This is a demonstration, so you know I can say all I want about this isn't going to happen or that isn't going to happen. But what we really need is is uh, proof to validate what we're saying. So we will be monitoring. Uh, we will have a monitoring program that will include cameras and, and other mechanisms uh, through which we can either see what's going on or prevent uh, uh, any 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 uh, marine mammals and, and larger fish. From going through the through the turbine, so I think you know I, this is a demonstration. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence in any other other locations or sites uh, that we have been involved in where there is any issues with with fish. But we have to make sure that that's the case. We have done the EPRI study. Uh, there's another company called Verdant that has has also done an extensive uh, amount of of uh, monitoring of uh, an installation with a horizontal axis turbine that looks more like a, like a wind turbine in the East River in New York. And they also have done some tests with, uh, with a vertical axis turbine like ours as well. Any other questions? Okay, well, as time is, is moving on, I'd just like to uh, give a, a, a big thanks to our, our panelists tonight. Uh, it's very good of them to come from all locations here on the island and uh, give a very, very strong and insightful overview of ocean energy on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. Thank you again and uh, be sure to follow our next event at um, UVic, uh, University of Victoria, May the 24th, where we'll be looking at the entrepreneur side, the business side of the green tech. And uh, it'll be, it's, it's, uh, it's aimed to be a very, very strong uh, debate and informative presentation so i invite you all to attend if you can if you can't uh, log on and uh, you'll be able to uh, attend or, or view the presentation on, online okay thank you again for coming and uh, a big uh, warm appreciation to don gillingham of north island college and vic goodman of the rivercore corporation again thank you all